Hello everyone. Today I'm going to be taking a look at a Lovecraftian skirmish game from P-Work War Games, Altar of the Dead Gods. All right then, let's take a look at Altar of the Dead Gods. Uh, so this is written by Paolo Baracci and Michel Finelli. Possibly. Possibly not how you pronounce those names. I'm sorry. Uh, it is a Lovecraftian skirmish game. Now, it has a very renaissance uh, sort of feel. Um, it's not specifically tied to a time period, though. So you could move this around if you want. Um, the book itself is uh, soft cover and is just shy of 100 pages, 99 pages long. Uh, and in that you get the breakdown of the backstory for Altar of the Dead Gods, um, which is sort of told ad hoc throughout it in various ways. So essentially the cultists or a cultist um, has been looking for this lost temple for a long time, finally gets a lord to um, dig some foundations for an extension to his land, and they break through into this uh, and discover a whole world of horror underground, uh, which attracts various people for various reasons. Uh, the book itself is beautifully presented. There's a mix of esoterica like this, which I'm sure somebody will probably translate, because I'm imagining based on everything else it is. Um, you've got Latin pieces, very much like you would find in a, a Lovecraftian mythos book, um, strange symbols and sigils, uh, and even the chapter headings are done in a similar way. So you have this uh, Dineva Tates Mortis Ex Avum, um, but then underneath you also have these footnotes in English. Um, Listen to the voices in the silence perform forgotten rituals enchant yourself with lost knowledge. Um, or in some cases, my particular favourite is the moving version, uh, which we'll get to in a moment. So you get a descriptor of what you need to play, dice, miniatures, cards, and the like, and then how the game plays out. So you play out on a gridded board, uh, and then there are the key for various things. So shrine is a three by three altar, your relic tokens, your various walls. Uh, these tie into a bit of kit we'll look at in a moment from P Worked. Um, the token system, you've got two different types of tokens. Uh, you've got square tokens, which are um, removed at the end of the round. And then you've got oddly shaped tokens, which are persistent. Um, so they are normally tied to in-game actions of some description, whether they're attacks or special actions. Here we go, how to move, like I say, my favorite. Learn how to move without being dismembered within minutes of the game. Um, so yeah, it has a really nice Cthulhu feel to it. The game itself plays very, very quick, uh, easy to pick up. It is, like I say, grid based. You have a blind spot uh, and a facing. Uh, therefore, you should really mount your stuff on square bases like God intended, uh, but it's entirely up to you. There is no specific miniature range associated with this, so you can use whatever you want. Uh, and that's why I'm saying, even though it has a, a feel of a specific um, period, it's not tied to it. So if you don't have uh, sort of 17th, 18th century Venetian mask wearing cultists, you could use something else. Um, whether it's the the masked cultists from Silver Bayonet uh, from the 19th century or what have you, it's entirely up to you. Uh, so rules are fairly well laid out. You will run into a couple of, I'm going to call them translation faux pas. They're not errors. It doesn't stop you understanding the rule. It's just the wording is a little odd. Um, so, yeah, the the English could have done with a final sweep clean up on it, but it's it's nothing that's going to stop you from playing or enjoying the game. 
Uh, Faction-wise, there are six in the book. So you've got vampires, you've got hunters, witches, uh, pilgrims of the church, uh, cultists themselves, which I really want to play with, and then the decadent waltz. I wasn't sure when I first seen this as to whether or not this was a, a mistranslation of something, because before we seen the actual book, we'd just seen the, the faction list. Uh, but no, it is. Uh, think the Vincent Price film, The Mask of the Red Death, um, they're all, you know, highfalutin members of high society um, doing whatever they want to do. And uh, here you can see how the game is sort of structured. Uh, we'll have a look at this with the, the cards in a moment. But essentially a faction has a couple of traits they can pick from. They've got minions they can pick from and they've got heroes. Um, and generally one exalted hero, uh, which is limited... Uh, so overall, the uh, the book itself offers a lot of interesting possibilities uh, for small-scale skirmishes and campaigns. You've got a set of um, scenarios at the back, but then I feel like you could expand this, or it could be expanded to have a, a more structured campaign system with it as well, uh, which would be really nice. Like I say, you've got the the, the background, the flavour text coming through that uh, throughout. So that's the book. And essentially that's really all you need to play beyond the miniatures and, and your terrain because um, you can go on to the P-Work War Games website and download the cards for the six factions for free right now. And you can also download the tokens. Um, so it doesn't take much to get into it. Now, they have produced uh, a whole raft of additional pieces, um, which means you can essentially get a, a, a bundle which has everything you will need to play all six factions and all the scenarios in perpetuity. Uh, and we'll have a look at those in a bit more detail now. First off, there is a mat. So... The game structure is such that everything is played on this mat. Uh, this is a neoprene mat, uh, 17 by 25. As you can see, it's got a, a green marble texture, um, sort of dark and light and patches on it. It's, it's a really nice, nice gridded setup. Um, and being an old World of Darkness player and uh, a fan of Vampire the Masquerade, I appreciate the green marble. So there's that. The squares themselves are doo, 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 30 mil by 30 mil, which means your 20 mil stuff will sit on them perfectly. And then the larger pieces that get produced today, sort of 25, 32, that sort of thing, you make it slight overhang, but nothing untoward. So if I pop Ramirez down there, I mean, if you're going to send somebody in to clear out a nest of cultists, then the mortal's probably a good way. Uh, so he's on a 25 mil square, so plenty of room in there without having to worry about nudging other miniatures out of the way. Although because it is miniature agnostic, you may end up doing that anyway. Then there are the decks. So Primus and Secundus. Uh, each contains three of the factions. Like I say, you can just download and print these yourself um, if you so desire. I like having the actual cards because I don't like having to go through a printer. Um, so within both decks, you will find a set of quick rules. Um, so the turn sequence is very simply roll for initiative. Uh, it's 2d6 pick and you the highest wins uh, if your warband has been stomped somewhat then you roll 3d6 uh, if you have less models on the table or fewer if you want to be grammatically correct uh, then your opponent roll 3d6 and pick the highest two uh, then you do your combat that's all the miniatures activating in whatever way shape or fashion you feel and then finally there's the bleeding phase where end of uh, round uh, actions happen so units that are 
bled will take additional damage, uh, objectives are scored, things like that. And then you remove all your bleed and activation tokens uh, and then start again. There's also a little card uh, that gives you the scenarios on it as well. Now, then we get into the meat and potatoes. So if I pull out the vampire faction, there's our mission generator there. Um, so each faction is constructed out of seven models. Uh, the model or your faction warband must contain three heroes. So for vampires, there is one exalted vampire hero. And you can only ever have one exalted. You don't have to take an exalted, but you'd be foolish not to. Um, it has their stats down here. We'll go into those in a moment. There's a bride, again, zero to one. Thralls, zero to two. And for that, you get two cards. So if you choose to take them both, then you've got a card to track damage for both of them. Um, so from uh, top to bottom, we have the little compass is movement. Then you have, uh, so that's the amount of squares you can move. Then you have their potency, which is the amount of dice they roll in combat. You have your guard, which is the amount of die you roll in defense. Uh, then you have the health, how much damage it takes to remove them, and finally, range. So if it's range one, it has to be adjacent. If it's further than that, uh, then you have a range weapon of some description, like a sharpshooter. Uh, so when you pick your three heroes, this could be one of each, two thralls and a bride, two thralls and a vampire. Um, whatever way you want to do, very simple as far as list building goes. Three heroes go into your gang, and then after your three heroes, you need to take four minions. And with your minions, you have Undead Servitor, Lingering Spirit, Bat Swarm, and that's that. Yes, that's that. So again, there are limits on some of these. So you can only bring two uh, Lingering Spirits, but you could bring three Servitors or three minions. They have different abilities sometimes so push and bleed and this is a special action if it's got the little cthulhu tentacle um which works as a as a separate action when it comes to you know, move attack or special action that's your, that's your choices really um so you would take four in any combination of these depending on what you want to do that is your warband built and the final thing to do is to choose your faction special ability and with the special abilities we have mortal curse and into the night uh, and this tells you um well, it doesn't tell you this is a way of changing how your faction plays so if we look at a mortal curse if an allied hero has uh, one wound or sorry allied exalted heroes have minus one wound so they start slightly easier to kill however if a hero will be slain, you may choose a single bat swarm. And if you do so, that hero is not slain. Instead, remove all the tokens from that hero and move them, including the damage, onto the bat swarm instead and remove the bat swarm from the table. Then place the hero where the bat swarm was. So he'll disappear from one square, reappear in another square. You lose a bat swarm, but your hero is much better off for it. Uh, and then there's also into the night. At the start of the game, you may deploy additional bat swarms uh, sorry, you may deploy bat swarms instead of any number of your heroes. They have the same stats and rules as a regular one, but at the end of the first round, choose a bat swarm and replace it with a non-deployed hero, including any damage that the bats happen to have taken. Uh, and then you can repeat this process two more times. If you choose not to bring them on, and the, all your bat swarms get removed from play, then you've lost a hero as well. Uh, so you can see with these, you may want to choose, I mean, maybe a couple of bat swarms at the back, staying out of trouble, to help protect uh, or give you options for your uh, your exalted vampire. But with this one, you might want to spam loads of bat swarms, push them forward, and then it gives you options as to where they can deploy from, uh, thus gaining the upper hand on your opponent. And all the faction decks are like that. So you get your mix of heroes, minions, and then faction traits to allow you to build whatever way you see fit. 
Next up, there are tokens. Again, you can just download these from the uh, website. They come as MDF, just flat laser cut. These are little bonfires for the pilgrims. Uh, so nice, neat little pieces of, of wood, good for tracking wounds, activations, and special abilities. Uh, I've threw some color onto some of them, uh, very quickly just sprayed them. So little hourglass for your activation, bleed marker, damage trackers, which are very cute little hearts, uh, a crippled token, and then haunting. Uh, so if somebody kills a lingering spirit from the vampires, they get haunted. It reduces their guard by one as well. Like I say, square tokens do not persist, so are removed at the end of the bleed phase, leaving you ready for the new phase. And if it's got a, a a funny shape then it stays in some regards instead whether that's a bonfire or a trap token or crippled whatever it happens to be these are good quality um nice thick three mil mdf um, like i say it's just a a good way of tracking what's happening on the tabletop and the blister contains 76 of them which is every token you will ever need now Finally, there is the Buried Temple. So there is a specific set of shrine and wall requirements to build any of the scenarios in the book or to start building your own. Um, again, you can make your own, but they have made a set of um, MDF terrain that will do it. The bundle contains all the walls, big and small, some crumbling pillars, it contains the relics, which are lootable objectives, and then the altars and shrines, which are your capturable objectives. Uh, so if we just have a quick look at those. So these are your crumbling walls. There's a couple of different um, sections essentially so you can see there are some fallen masonry revealing different blasphemous symbols they are a simple three by one and quite neatly block off whatever you need them to block off again three mil mdf good sturdy build uh, when it comes to putting your masonry in between you've got some options there so they won't all look identical uh, but as a quick way of getting walls onto the table these are ideal and they mesh together very nicely so the set contains eight of those large walls then there are six of these small walls so almost like little archways again a couple of different designs So when you're building your underground temple, it will show up in a different way. These are just a, a flat one by one. And then there are four pillars. And the pillar sections, simple cubes, like you can see at the end of the walls. Um, and with these, you can build whatever you need to build. As you can see, there's no hollow, so you won't lose dice in them. Um, they are plugged and very robust. So they're going to stand the test of time quite nicely. Finally, we have our objectives. So there is the altar, and then there are two shrines. Shrines are identical. And then there's also the eight relic tokens with really nice little Cthulhu, uh, like the idol in the swamp from the story. 
hunched over, people dancing around and worshipping. So the idols are 30 mil round. Or so, yeah, the relics are 30 mil round. Um, two layers. So they've got a bit of heft to them and uh, stand out. And these are very simple paint jobs on them, but they look the part. The shrines are three by three, again, multi-layered. And uh, they have raised areas here. So when you're placing a miniature on the outside corners or in the center, you're fine. There's a bit of a slope with these. Where's my immortal? There we go. Which means a 25 mil base is okay to a certain extent. But you just have to push them further forward. But because they, the base is rather large on this, it's not too bad. I did find with a smaller 20 mil base, um, they were more prone to tipping. So that's just on the, uh, the little shrines, which are stepped. The altar is much, uh, much better for two reasons. One, it's raised like all good altars should be. Um, and two, it still has that sloping down, but because it's raised, you can pop your base underneath as long as it's not too big. So a standard base will fit under that uh, and the miniature will sit quite comfortably. Yes, you'll have to pull people out if you're backing them up or moving them around, but um, it does the job wonderfully well and looks good doing it also. So that's the um, altar buried temple set for Altar of the Dead Gods, rather. Um, yeah. So there you have it, folks. A uh, really fun little game from P-Work. A um, lot of potential for expansion, for campaigns, for new bits and pieces to be dropped in. And a very simple premise and setup as well. So it's all very self-contained. That 17 by 25 mat is the extent of your game. Um, now, once you start playing it, you'll realize that you can make up your own scenarios to your heart's content, or you can start changing things. Maybe do a bit of a dungeon crawl, uh, introduce corridors leading up to the main room. Um, but if you just want to play the base game, being able to pick up the mat and all the walls and terrain in one bundle is really handy. It's a very uh, cheap buy-in as well. It's, it's about 30 euro. I think it's actually slightly less than that for the altars, the relics, and all the walls together. So that's everything you need to play on. You just need then the mat, uh, whether it's one of P-Works mats or one of their books or whatever it happens to be. Uh, and then just go nuts. Um, six factions are relatively diverse at the moment. I think there's ex definitely expansion possibilities. You've really only got one main ranged faction with the, the hunters. Uh, everybody else is kind of up close and personal. So having tight, constricted corridors makes a lot of sense. People are going to have to go chasing after each other. Uh, if somebody's bringing the hunters, you don't want them just to be shooting you off the table from turn one. Uh, but yeah, uh, really nice to see their first foray into the uh, tabletop gaming uh, of their own, uh, rather than just making mats and, and terrain for other people's games. Let me know what you think below. And if you've had a chance to try it out, uh, let us know what you think of that as well. There is a Let's Play coming soon with myself and Ben as we give the rules a bit of a, a dust off and push out uh, to see what we think of it as well. So keep your eyes peeled for that one. Until next time, bye bye. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.